<laughs> closer, a bit closer. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, this session is going to be about intu intuition. My uh, my particular interest this year is in intuitions of time and uh, what I call knowing when. And uh, I try to invite people who have a similar similar interest in our um, our um, I think our, our human capacity for for knowing about the physical material world that we live in. And we have an expert in the history of acoustics and um, someone who's a mathematician and specialist in improvisation, improvised music and all sorts of musical practice. My own talk is going to be about the inside out trombone and uh, we have a, a, a special extra at the end. <laughs> A, a person who's just developed an instrument this year, which I think is really uh, illustrating um, the kind of magic of musical instrument making is Erfan. Um, I'd hope to have uh, Sanislas Dehaene here. He's a neurologist from France, a young neurologist whose specialty is um, uh, cognition of quantity and cognition of time. And uh, unfortunately, his isn't available, so uh, that's sort of a subject which I think will run through this. The idea that music isn't something that you that you um, deal with through representations; it's something you deal with directly, the same way you bicycle, you know, ride a bicycle or uh, play ball or something like that. Music is cer certainly something you can learn to become quite an expert. Is not that you don't have to take music lessons or that you don't have to spend 12 years <laughs> alone with your instrument before you can play it. It's just that that it's, I think, a misrepresentation to say that this is something which is outside of you, that, it, that music is something which other people only know and you don't know. You're actually already, from childhood, totally um, aware of music and totally able to particip participate in enjoying music. And the fact that complete amateurs can enjoy music by complete professionals, complete experts, is an indication that we somehow share some kind of... Um, of um, common cognitive grounds for for this this experience, and I, I'm very influenced in this, of course, by by Chomsky, who did this kind of liberation of language back in the 50s and 60s, where he tried to show that that um, that we have a language sense, that we have innate cognitive abilities which allow us to uh, comprehend and communicate. And grammarians, while they're very interesting from a scholarly point of view, and they do, in fact, actually change language, the belief is among now Chomskyites is that grammarians are actually the people who break language. That actually, if you put a <laughs> if you put a child in a situation where language is broken, the child will recover and correct the language. He'll actually come up with a grammar that's more consistent than the broken language, say, of his multilingual parents who don't quite speak the language he speaks. The child will be able to correct. And I think that's the same sort of process that operates in music. We do know when. We know, you, you, can, you can see last night with Talk Tech, that wonderful way he put his hands down and then reached up for the music, each, each time knowing exactly when he wanted to add something to the music. And that's something we, the fact that we could recognize that meant that we know when too. Yeah. It's not, so it's not like music is a script or a secret code that exists out here. Um, that only Pythagoras really understands. <laughs> it's something. It's something deeply inside our consciousness, and I think that there are many, many, many of um, these kind of cognitive channels operating all the time in music. I mean, you can you can count, you can measure duration, you can measure accelerations and velocity. I'm using physics language because that's what I studied, but you probably don't have to do that. <laughs> but the thing is, you um, you are aware of multiple channels of time flowing through music. And um, hopefully we'll have some time to talk about these maybe maybe afterwards. But uh, we're going to start with um, a talk by Penelope Gu, who's a specialist in historical acoustics. I mean, the, the practice of acoustics and uh, the way it permeates, especially the Renaissance period. Uh, yeah, yeah, 17th century. Yeah, 17th century. And she's a research fellow, an honorary research fellow at the unit. We're getting to the age where we're all honorary, I guess. <laughs> No, you're a real professor still. Yes. Uh, so am I, sort of. I'm part time, half retired, half honorary. I'm the honorary director of STEM or something. Um, um, she's from the University of Manchester and she's going to talk about technologies of musical wonder. If uh, we could get a display. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Is that working? Can you hear me? Good. Okay, great. The Renaissance was a period of increasing wealth and leisure among the European elite. 
These discerning patrons not only accumulated luxury goods from all over the globe, but also expected to be entertained and aroused to wonder with new and powerful devices that demonstrated ingenuity and technical skills of the highest order. Their world of musical experience was also becoming enriched in ways hitherto unimagined. This enrichment was partly due to the production of new musical instruments, partly to the creation of new acoustic environments such as private gardens, theatres and opera houses, and partly to reports and actual instruments brought back from the New World, Asia and the Far East. As we will see, musical instruments played a significant role in the cultivation of wonder, as instrument makers and musicians sought to create new soundscapes and to explore their tonal possibilities. Paradoxically, however, many new musical experiences that emerged in the 16th and 17th centuries arose in the context of harking back to lost sonic worlds that were only accessible through the silent medium of texts. Just as Renaissance artists, architects and poets sought to emulate the achievements of the ancient Greeks and Romans, so a handful of musicians experimented with instruments designed to recreate the marvellous effects of music described in antiquity. To add to this ancient modern paradox, these musical experiments also proved to be inextricably bound up with the emergence of experimental science in the 17th century. But before I show how this scientific development took place, we need to see why these musical experiments were also crucially associated with magic. Have the first slide, please. As one of the wealthiest city-states in Italy, Renaissance Florence was a major cultural centre where the leading Medici family promoted the study of ancient texts as well as lavish public and courtly spectacles including music. In the mid-15th century, the so-called Platonic Academy was created under the patronage of Cosimo de' Medici. This was an informal gathering under the tutelage of the philosopher and priest Marsilio Ficino, whose members met to discuss philosophy, literature and music with a view to recapturing the glories of classical Greece and Rome. One topic which proved especially fascinating to these Renaissance scholars was the power of ancient poetry and music to bring about marvellous, even magical effects and the ethical role that these arts evidently played in ancient public life. Newly translated texts such as Plato's Republic and Laws and Aristotle's Politics and Poetics offered a tantalising glimpse into the musical and oratorical, oratorical practices of long-vanished civilizations. So, next one, please. However, there were also more esoteric texts which Ficino edited that added a further dimension to the Academy's understanding of the past. Ficino's editions of the Orphic Hymns of 1462, the Corpus of, oh, Hermeticum of 1463, and Plotinus's Enneads of 1492 revealed how ancient wise men or magi, like Hermes shown here, used music to invoke gods and demons, to cure disease, and to draw down beneficial planetary influences. Were the tales about Orpheus and Pythagoras purely mythical, or could these men really raise the dead? charm beasts, calm passions, and harness astral influences through songs and instruments? Did they achieve these effects with supernatural help, or was it through their understanding of the hidden forces of nature? In other words, were they practicing demonic or natural magic? Despite the church's prohibition of all magic, it seems that Ficino was willing to experiment with these potentially dangerous activities. In 1489, he published three books on life, in which he outlined a set of practical techniques for drawing down astral influences and nourishing the spirits through the power of music and song. What is significant about Ficino's natural magic for this paper is its deliberately experimental nature. His magical songs are perhaps the earliest example of what we might call the early music impulse to recreate past musical practices as authentically as possible for it seems that he tried to reconstruct the sounds that the ancient Greek philosopher Pythagoras and his disciples used to cure melancholy, to prolong life, and to bring them into contact with the divine by means of sonic power. In his experiments, Ficino most likely set words from the Orphic hymns he edited to the music of the lyra, a word used at the time for various types of stringed instrument, as well as for, as for those of ancient Greece. And we can now see a picture of a, a, a lyra. In Ficino's case, this was probably the lyra de braccio, because this reminded Renaissance musicians of the Greek lyra, or kithara, even though it was not actually descended from these instruments. Although we have no idea what his astrological music sounded like, 
Its significance for us lies in Ficino's attempt to create, recreate a lost sonic world, an impulse which we will see was shared by others in the later Renaissance. The next one, please. The influence of classical antiquity can also be shown in another new form of musical practice that emerged around 1495 and soon became widespread across Europe. This was the viol consort, a newly invented family of stringed instruments that was introduced by Isabella d'Este to the Gonzaga court at Mantua. Her idea was to cultivate consort music, i.e. music in parts, among musically literate amateurs as part of their courtly identity. Although consorts of professional wind players were already in existence, it was a new development for patrons to make music in this fashion. The practice was encouraged by Isabella's humanist agenda. This drew on classical mythology, for example, the story of Apollo and his lyre, and Neoplatonic philosophy to associate the playing of vials with nobility, virtue, and stability of the social order. After all, it was Plato himself who established the same musical proportions were found in the soul, in the state, and in the heavens, and that certain kinds of harmony promoted a healthy and stable society. This woodcut, dating from 1516, is the earliest illustration of this new practice. However, as if to emphasize the vile consort's ancient credentials, the picture depicts the venerable philosophers Aristotle and Plato playing in consort with the equally revered physicians Galen and Hippocrates. In fact, the primary purpose of the image was to represent the intellectual harmony between the philosophies of these men. However, we can imagine the sounds that this picture would have brought to mind in 1516 by listening to the following extract of a polyphonic chanson by Marbrianus de Orto. It is taken from Petrucci's Odecaton, published in Venice between 1501 and 1506. So we just hear a little bit. Okay. Uh, two important texts that stimulated Renaissance interest in ancient musical marvels and acoustic wonders were ten books on architecture by the Roman architect Vitruvius of about 15 BC and mechanics by the Greek mathematician Hero of Alexandria in the first century AD. These ancient treatises provided an inspiration for engineers and their patrons with their descriptions of amphitheatres with resonating vases to improve their acoustics, hydraulic organs, musical automata and speaking statues. Once again we find the Medicis as prominent patrons of curious devices which display technical skill at the same time as giving delight. The most famous Mannerist garden was created for the Grand Duke Francesco I at Pratolino between 1569 and 1584 by Bernardo Buontalenti. Together with other skilled engineers, Buontalenti reconstructed many of the mechanical and acoustical marvels described by Hero with the aim of arousing wonder at the hidden powers of nature and at his mastery of these effects. Next one, please. The Quirinal Palace in Rome had a similarly renowned water organ, the remains of which still survive. We know what it looked like and how it worked, thanks to the description and illustrations found in the Jesuit scholar Athanasius Kircher's Universal Music Making of 1650. The automatic organ was powered by a pin barrel mechanism turned by the action of water flowing across a wheel. Also of interest are the figures of the blacksmiths striking their hammers on an anvil that we can see in the top left-hand corner. This is a reference to the story of Pythagoras discovering the mathematical proportions governing the musical consonances when he passed by a blacksmith's forge and heard musical sounds. In the next one, please. He supposedly weighed their various hammers and found that those with the weights in a ratio of one to two sounded the interval of an octave. Those with the ratio of two to three sounded a fifth and so forth. In fact, these ratios applied to string lengths rather than weights, but the principle of empirically demonstrating the laws of consonants still applies. 
While these organs were designed to follow an already existing tradition of manufacture, there were also other new instruments invented in the 16th century. Again, the influence of antiquity can also be seen in the two examples that I'm going to describe to you. The first of these was facilitated by the patronage of Ippolito d'Este, Cardinal of Ferrara, who supported the attempts of the musician Niccolo Vincentine to make the chromatic and enharmonic tuning systems, which are different from the diatonic which are used today, described by ancient theorists to make them accessible to modern practitioners. As well as researching into ancient and medieval music theory, Vicentino was also, also tested some tuning systems of his own. The impetus for his experiments not only came from the desire to restore a lost sonic art which could sway the passions, tame animals and cure ailments, but also from a desire to expand the tonal range of his instrument to make it more flexible for accompanying singers. It was in his ancient music adapted to modern practice of 1555 that Vicentino described his invention of the archicembalo, a harpsichord-like instrument with two manuals and six ranks of keys. This significantly increased the number of pitches available to the performer and allowed transposition into a range of keys at the same time as keeping the consonances pure. In other words, this keyboard was most emphatically not due to equal temperament where all the intervals are compromised, but rather prioritised pure intervals such as the third and fifth. Next one, please. The second new instrument I want to talk about was the chitarone. This is a large lute-like instrument with an extended neck and an extra course of strings that was invented in 1589 by the lutenist Antonio Naldi. The occasion was a sumptuous musical production that took place as part of the wedding celebrations of the Grand Duke Ferdinand de Medici and Christine of Lorraine. Staged by Count Giovanni de Bardi, whom I'll say more about, this production comprised a series of elaborate intermedi or interludes on the theme of the power of music that took place in between acts of a comic play. As its name suggests, the Chitarani represented a deliberate attempt to imitate the ancient Kithara, which was known to have been used in antiquity by poets to accompany their verse, although, of course, there were no surviving examples to model it on. At the beginning of the first interlude, which was on the theme of the harmony of the spheres, two chitaroni, a lute and an organ, are used to accompany, were used to accompany the singer Vittoria Archilei in a newly invented style of song known as monody. Here the rhythm and melody follow the manner and speaking voice of someone possessed of a certain affection or mood, again an invention deliberately intended to recreate the effects achieved in the ancient Greek theatre. So we just hear a little bit of this opening... This new style of singing was to become central to opera, the birth of which is normally considered to have taken place in 1600, when Jacopo Peri's Eurydice was staged in Florence. However, for the origins of monody, we have to go back some 30 years to the point when Bardi began to convene an informal academy, which met to perform songs and to discuss a wide range of subjects, including music, poetry and astrology. Apart from Bardi himself, two of the most important members of the Florentine Camerata were Vincenzo Galilei, a skilled lutenist and father of the more famous Galileo, and Girolamo May, a renowned expert on Greek music theory. These three men were passionately committed to the revival of the ethical effects of ancient Greek music, in other words, its capacity to move the affections. They believed this could only be achieved through setting verses to music in the same way that the Greeks had done, a technique which was, of course, hard to discover since no instruments or sounds were available on which to model their efforts. It was thanks to May's research on ancient Greek practice in the 1570s and early 1580s that they had a basis for developing a style of performance which seemed to capture its essence. 
In fact, the Florentine Camerata's pursuit of an ancient ideal not only led to entirely new forms of musical and artistic practice, i.e. monody and opera, but also contributed to the development of a new form of scientific practice which emerged in the 17th century. This was the so-called experimental philosophy which generated scientific knowledge through the use of instruments. The development took place because in the course of the Camerata's discussions about ancient music, they came to disagree about the nature of musical consonants and also began to focus on problems associated with tuning instruments. These problems, they believed, could only be resolved empirically. In effect, they were using musical instruments as scientific instruments with a view to generating reliable knowledge experimentally. Up to this point, the theory governing consonants was still based on the mathematical principles set out by Boethius's book on music, which dated from the 6th century AD. Boethius was the most important source for the story of Pythagoras' discovery of the relationship between arithmetical ratios and the proportions of the musical scale. It is fascinating to learn that although at first Galilei believed this account, by the late 1580s he became the first person to actually check the results of Pythagoras' experiments arising from the Blacksmith's Forge. In the process he discovered that most of them were incorrect. This revelation proved to be the starting point for further investigations into properties of musical strings and other resonating bodies that his own son Galileo and other natural philosophers began to conduct in the early 17th century. Next slide, please. In fact, the Florentine Camerata was not the earliest Italian academy interested in experimentation and wonder. A precursor was the Accademia Segreda in Naples, whose members were fascinated with secrets and magic in the 1540s. Some, ideas of their, uh, some idea of their activities can be gleaned from Giambattista della Porta's Magia Naturalis, i.e. Natural Magic, first published in 1558. Among other things, this book contains chapters on hydraulic organs and experiments with wind instruments. It became the starting point for the investigation of Porta's own Academia dei Secreti, which met in Naples during the 1560s and early 1570s. Porta went on to publish an enlarged second edition of the Magia Naturalis in 1589. This expanded version, which became an international bestseller, included other musical and acoustical marvels which had a direct influence on the development of 17th century acoustics. So what exactly was natural magic and why should it be relevant to the emergence of experimental science? As Ficino, Porta and other authorities were keen to emphasise, natural magic concentrated on the production of marvellous effects whose causes were hidden but were purely natural rather than demonic in character. Advocates of natural magic claimed that the universe was governed by harmonic principles and an active spirit that linked the macrocosm to the microcosm. They also assumed that the true magus was able to uncover these harmonies and to manipulate vital hidden forces in nature. Sound, especially musical harmony, was a particularly important dimension of natural magic because it had the power to transform mood and behaviour by action at a distance. Next one, please. The phenomenon of sympathy or musical resonance was a classic demonstration of this occult power where the playing of one instrument, for example the lute as you see in this illustration, causes the strings on another to vibrate sympathetically. As the lutenist plucks the strings of his instrument, those of the instrument on the table vibrate sympathetically and causes the straw laid across them to move without being touched. So this is uh, happening without any, uh, any clear sense of how it happens. It seems to be invisible to the, to the senses. Other important magical principles were the belief that art can effectively imitate nature and also that instruments can overcome the limits set on the unaided human senses. Thus the eye, for example, can be aided by optical devices to see further, spectacles, the telescope, while the ear can be assisted with hearing devices that enable sounds to be heard over long distances, so the speaking trumpet or the hearing trumpet. This manipulative approach is to nature is now accepted as characteristic of experimental science and technology, but in the 16th 70th century it was most often recognised as a feature of magic. Next slide. 
In the course of the 17th century, however, the status of natural magic declined, while experimental philosophy increasingly gained recognition. The English aristocrat and natural philosopher Francis Bacon played a highly influential role in this complex process. If we focus on his efforts to establish what he first called acoustica, it becomes clear that many of the most powerful features of natural magic were simply taken over by the experimental philosophy. Bacon sketched out a reliable method of generating new and powerful knowledge, an aspect of his work which is seen to, which is seen to anticipate modern scientific method. Yet we should notice that Bacon himself described his new method as a form of natural magic, which was, quote, the science which applies the knowledge of hidden forms to the production of wonderful operations. The broad contours of Bacon's acoustical program were elaborated in two of his most popular works, The Silver Silvarum and New Atlantis, both published in 1626. His vision of Solomon's house, described in the New Atlantis, includes remarkable oral wonders, which as a summary of existing and future technologies is worth quoting extensively. We also have sound houses, where we practice and demonstrate all sounds and their generation. We have harmonies which you have not, of quarter tones and lesser slides of sound. Diverse instruments of music likewise to you unknown, some sweeter than any you have together with bells and rings that are dainty and sweet. We represent small sounds as great and deep. Likewise, great sounds extenuate and sharp. We make diverse tremblings and warblings of sounds. We represent and imitate all articulate sounds and letters and the voices and notes of beasts and birds. We have certain helps which set to the ear do further hearing greatly. We also have diverse strange and artificial echoes, reflecting the voice many times and as it were tossing it. We have also means to convey sounds in trunks and pipes, in strange lines and distances. While the New Atlantis concentrates on the creation of effects, Bacon Silver addresses the causes of particular phenomena. Among the principal themes addressed in the silver are the general properties of sound, a comparison of light and sound, the construction of acoustical instruments, and a systematic investigation into the different properties of musical instruments. A major inspiration for this was Porter's Magia Naturalis. But Bacon also knew from his own experience at the English court that instrument makers and the royal musicians were engaged in experiments designed to produce particular emotional effects in their audiences, which was the essence of the Baroque style. The way that Bacon's experience of courtly musical practice shaped his thinking is vividly demonstrated in his observation that the sweetest and best harmony is when every part or instrument is not heard by itself, but a conflation of them all. Just as we saw in the case of the Galileans, father and son, the scientific investigation into the nature of harmony which Bacon proposed followed from experiments that had already been successfully conducted by musicians themselves. This trend was continued in England with the founding of the Royal Society in 1660, a body devoted to experimental philosophy that looked back to Bacon for their inspiration and guide. Before we consider what the Royal Society had to do with acoustics in the latter part of the 17th century, let us turn to two other influential figures in the development of this emerging discipline. Both individuals were Catholic monks who wrote encyclopedic works on music and who believed that the universe was constructed musically. However, the French minim friar Marin Massen, the author of Harmonie Universelle, published in 1636, was one of the most vociferous critics of the fashionable occult philosophy. Against this, the German Jesuit Kircher, who published his Universal Music Making in 1650, grounded his work in the occult tradition. Next slide. During the 1620s and 30s, Mersenne undertook a comprehensive investigation into the nature of sound that Bacon seems only to have dreamt of. From a practical perspective, one of the most important components of the Harmonie Universelle is the Traité des Instruments, which is still one of the most valuable sources for our knowledge of 17th century performance practice. Next slide. Divided into strings, keyboards, wind and percussion, and also including folk and non-Western instruments, the work includes illustrations and detailed dis discussions of tuning practices to an extent never previously achieved. 
Although he borrowed some of his ideas and illustrations from earlier publications, it is clear that Mersenne also acquired information directly from musicians and instrument makers attached to the French court, and their expertise played a significant part in his investigations. From a scientific perspective, musical instruments provided Mersenne with the apparatus for investigating many puzzling properties of sound. However, his most significant contribution to experimental science is judged to be his discovery of the laws governing the vibration of strings and pendulums. Mersenne's laws, as they are now known, proved one of the most successful applications of mathematics to the physical world before Newton's laws of gravity, and as such provided a powerful model for other branches of physics. Next slide. Next slide. Oh. Yeah. No. Oops, back. Go back. Oh, well, it was Kircher, yeah. Okay. Kircher divided much of the substance of his book from Mersenne's work, even though he still promoted the concept of natural magic. Indeed, magic appears as a distinct category in its own right in Book 9, which deals with the magic of consonants and dissonance, which can be explained in purely natural terms. The first part of the book focuses on the psychological and emotional effects of music. He then considers its therapeutic properties. And we've got the next slide there. One of his examples of music's healing powers is the cure of Saul's melancholy by David's lyre, which is mentioned in the Old Testament. The next one, please. Another uh, example he was particularly interested in was the cure of the tarantula spider's bite, which can only be achieved through energetic dancing. Also, although Kierke did not explicitly classify automatic musical instruments and composition sheet machines as magical, they were included in Book 9 because of their various sources of power, such as sunlight or wind or water, are hidden from view. Despite the important contribution Kierke made to acoustics, his framework of natural magic was not widely favoured among European intellectuals in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Next slide. The Royal Society of London, for example, one of the first public societies devoted to the experimental pursuit of natural philosophy, looked to Francis Bacon for their model of science. In 1666, the French Académie Royale des Sciences was established. The creation of these public bodies marked a major step towards the recognition of experiment as a valuable philosophical enterprise. Nevertheless, there was a clear overlap in subject matter between natural magic and the new experimental philosophy. Contact with Kircher and other figures who promoted natural magic was also cultivated. In the first 20 years of the Royal Society, a number of acoustical and musical instruments were demonstrated at its meetings. I've got one here. No, next one. Yeah, thanks. These included the monochord and the archicembalo in 1664, the hearing trumpet in 1665, and the speaking trumpet in 1670, which you see here. Uh, and even a toothed wheel that could be rotated to produce musical sounds in 1681 that was similar to Savart's wheel of the next century. This latter device was invented by Robert Hooke, who was the first curator of the society's experiments and who seems to have been chiefly responsible for directing members' interests towards sound and music. Hooke seems to have been interested in musical phenomena but for using them to, the, to understand the harmonic structure of the universe. In brief, he believed the universe is made up of minute particles which act like vibrating strings, following the musical laws that Mersenne had established. Those of a similar bigness and matter vibrate in sympathy and cohere as solid bodies, while other vibrating particles, depending on their frequencies, make up different bodies or fluids. He also thought the universe was filled, uh, or you could conceptualise it, in terms of vibrating particles, which also obey Mersenne's laws. And he thought this, this model might potentially explain such different phenomena as gravity, magnetism, and light. And along with these musical analogies, Hooke used many of the experiments he conducted for the Royal Society as a means of demonstrating the harmony of nature. So he, for example, he, his tooth wheels showed a direct correspondence between pitch and frequency. And he suggested that the ear itself is like an instrument which was designed to respond sympathetically to vibrations within a particular range of frequencies. This account of Hooke's demonstrations before the Royal Society may seem to have taken us a long way from the musical and acoustical wonders sponsored by wealthy Renaissance patrons, but in reality the link between these realms of science and leisured entertainment was closer than you might think. 
In the first place, there was still an element of wonder in Hooke's demonstrations, which were meant to arouse curiosity and delight among society members. Secondly, his experimental style, developed in his role as curator of experiments, strongly resembled the practices of the wonder a figure whom Hooke said seems to aim at creating pleasure, admiration and wonder, and not of such a knowledge of bodies as might tend to practice. Lastly, the actual sites where the Royal Society met in London, for example Gresham College, were physically close to the theatres which aristocratic society members frequented and were equally regarded as places of entertainment. This proximity and even overlap between science and entertainment was continued into the 18th century where, when a number of mathematical practitioners began to give public lecture demonstrations on physics, including acoustics, to fee-paying audiences in major cities around Britain. Moreover, they took place in venues which were also used for dancing and musical consorts made available to the playing public, paying public. In other words, what we see happening in the latter part of the early modern period, at least in Britain, is a shift away from mostly courtly patronage, where the secrets of nature were only made accessible to a privileged few, towards a more inclusive commercial environment in which those with money to afford it could also access these kind of natural philosophical wonders. Thank you. And just at the end, I want to make uh, credits known, so if you could skip the next one and go on to the last thing. Have I got? Yeah, yeah. I was asked to give you the credit, so I've done that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Are there any questions uh, have arisen? I, I, I was at the very beginning. We were, you were talking about the. The discovery of ancient music on the part of the Italians after Massilio Pacino, and it's interesting to to think about this time, in which in which Italians who are right there in the Mediterranean haven't been able to speak Greek for 800 years and haven't been able to read the original manuscripts, and suddenly with Massilio Pacino you have someone who can actually, mm -hmm. and he's asked to read all these magic manuscripts, mm -hmm. harmonies and things like mm -hmm. that, and and at the same time um, a musical style is being developed, and it, you might say it's the origin of European music. Right? distinctly European music. And I was wondering because the idea is that they were trying to imagine a music that, that they couldn't hear because it was ancient music mm -hmm. and yet they were in direct contact with Greeks, really living Greeks who played lyrics mm -hmm. and lived in Crete or, or mm -hmm. you know, in Istanbul or mm -hmm. Alexandria or Cairo or something like mm -hmm. that. But they weren't interested in that music. Yeah. They were interested in a new music which they, which no one had heard in some way. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting moment in history. Yeah, this I think invention that, that's right. I mean, you don't really get that interest. I mean, Kierke becomes more interested in the 17th century. Yeah. Uh, by that time, the Jesuits were in all parts of the New bit, World, yeah. and they were. He was receiving all kinds of really interesting information about music, different musics, and so on. But in Ficino's time, um, they weren't. Uh, I mean, they were just beginning to think about the possibility of sort of music, uh, local, localized music, and, and uh, but they but always the Western theory is underpinned by this so-called continuous tradition going back to antiquity. You know, the, the legitimation of it is always with reference to the ancient Greeks, but not the modern Greeks. Not the modern Greeks. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's an interesting, yeah. interesting moment of this difference. Yeah. yeah. There must be a big story there. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, Dave. This passage you read. This uh, passage you read by Francis Bacon mm -hmm. um, is very famous in contemporary music circles. Um, Daphne Oram had it pinned to her door at the BBC I Radiophonic I Workshop. I can't hear you, actually. Sorry? I can't hear you very well. Ah, um, Daphne Oram had that passage pinned to her door at the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. Uh, in the early 60s, okay. uh, I came across it in the early 70s, and it seems to be a touchstone ever since. But I still don't really fully understand the context of it, it you know, where these extraordinarily prescient ideas came from. Um, and in, in some respects, I don't understand why they didn't develop further into a music, you know, because in a way they anticipate 20th century music, but uh, you know, why have those ideas existed in Francis Bacon's writing? Didn't they come to more clear fruition 
before the 20th century? Well, I think we mustn't underestimate the uh, localised nature of Bacon's uh, fame, if you like. I mean, well, having said that, it, 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 his Silver Silver Arm, uh, uh, so, sorry, and the New Atlantis, they did become bestsellers, but only sort of towards later in the century, so towards the end of the 17th century that you see that uh, happening. But the other... I mean, what's striking about Bacon is he doesn't put his money where his mouth is at all. I mean, he doesn't, as far as I know, he, do, he doesn't actually do his experiments, which is why Mersenne is important, because he really does. Um, but as far as the music goes, uh, where he got the ideas from, I mean, I think I'd like to believe that he was actually talking to musicians, you know, but we don't have evidence for it. I, I, well, that's why I'm pointing to the court circle. I mean, at this time, the English uh, court had the largest musical household in Europe, uh, and the largest stable one. I mean, it had, you know, bands of lutenists, uh, viol players, violins. It was bigger than in France and everything. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that, I mean, they were certainly experimenting, at least with the, you know, with the, uh, and how they were accompanying plays and things like that with Shakespeare and, and so on. Uh, but I think with, um, I still can't say, explain why they wouldn't do what you want them to do in the <laughs> In the sense that, I mean, the bacon is buried, the, the passage, I don't know if people know, it's about a mythical island called Ben Salem where a shipwrecked traveller arrives. And it's this very, uh, it's this utopian kind of society controlled by the priests sort of thing. So it's not a very promising starting point for, you know, free, <laughs> for free um, uh, musicians, uh, you know, uh, and everything. It was quite controlled. So it's very much more about, it's a bit like the sort of, um, uh, Foucauldian panopticon, you know, it's this totalizing power of actually harnessing control. It's not really with a view to, you know, uh, uh, raise wonder and delight, you know, it's quite interesting. Okay. And in those days, the reference for the musicians in the court would have been. Italian and Spanish and French as well, too. Yeah, I don't think the musicians would have been reading any of the treatises. Uh, I think, I mean, they, I mean, what they have, I mean, you have an amazing tradition. Yeah, what's very striking is that from the middle of the 16th century, again in England, Henry VIII starts it and it's cultivated by his children, particularly Queen Elizabeth. But you have these bands of uh, almost nomadic musicians, of families of musicians. Uh, so, for example, record a family, and there's, there's often uh, Jewish connections, which is quite striking, and they have links with the, the banking circles across Europe, mm. and so you have a, 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 and also the, as it were, the people involved in the philosophy. So there's a sort of clear nexus between the trade and the culture, um, the the musical practices which are being introduced, and then the sort of philosophical theory underpinning it. It's very, it's quite striking. That's very interesting. Well, we're running a little yeah, sure. late okay. time, but it was really yeah. uh, The next speaker is Corino Mazzola from the University. Uh, this uh, no, he's not going to do. It. Are you going to do? Are you going to do? Yeah, you going to do? Pop yes. Okay. okay. Is your audio? Yes, yeah. there is audio too. Um, music practice, and there are mathematical books. And a book about free jazz, because he's actually a free jazz musician, he has 20 CDs of free jazz. So it's a very unusual combination. Actually, musician, mathematicians are always interested in music. But for us, from the more experimental side of music, this is an interesting ally, I think, to have someone who can report from, <laughs> from the, the mathematical side. I'll just be improvising. Okay. Yes, um, so I'm, thank you for inviting me here. It's kind of an exotic thing, such a horrible abstract mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as you know, I'm also kind of a practicing free jazz pianist, so I have also the counterpoint. 
and I'm interested in concrete things too, so not, not only in abstract things. So Joel, uh, he stressed that time is something he's very much interested in. And my talk will be about gestural composition. And why are gestures related to time? Well, you know, when Einstein was asked what is time, he just made this movement. It's the movement of, <laughs> well, for you it's this direction <laughs> of the clock's pointers, yes? So he said it's essentially a gesture, mm -hmm. right? So I think our experience and the reality of time is not this abstract mathematical line, but it is a gestural kind of an embodiment of, of a dimension, and I think this is a motivation why I think gestural aspects are uh, kind of also relating to your question of, about time. Um, I'm talking here about uh, theory, and at the end I want also to demonstrate a little bit of a, a software which is related to this development of gestural composition. And, um, well, if you think I'm a mathematician, um, I was all, all often asked what is the kind of the connection between my kind of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde nature of a free jazz pianist and a mathematician and I think the solution would be what I now call this a joint relation between formulas and gestures. I think there are two worlds. Formulas are kind of packages, uh, wrapped things uh, developed by mathemat mathematicians but also used by musicians and music theorists and gestures are kind of this unfolding human uh, explanation and, and, and then also existentiality and to my mind mathematics and music are related to each other by two uh, kind of uh, opposite movements while Mathematicians start by you know, calculating gestures and then at the end produce some formulas which can be used by the general public without understanding what are their innards. Um, musicians more or less are more interested in, in kind of taking formulas like harmonic formulas or whatever, or Fourier, whatever you have, and unfolding them into gestures, right? So making music is really kind of unfreezing or thawing up frozen gestures. For me, a score is a kind of a bunch of frozen gestures. Also historically, they come from the Noem. So I mean, mm -hmm. that's the point, and that's also a difficult point for the new complexity, like Dylan and Ferner, how they, they produce kind of a paper, paper music, and then the poor musicians have to kind of unfold them until they are uh, producing gestures more or less faithfully, less faithfully in this case, uh, to the score. Sometimes impossible to play. Okay, so this is my approach, and uh, you see that some of my books. Uh, the Topos of Music was written in 2002, uh, was the last really formulaic, algebraic, abstract thing, and then I had a talk at the IRCOM in Paris where they wanted me to explain my free jazz, and I all of a sudden learned that my free jazz is less dis determined by uh, formulas than by my gestures. And I learned also from free jazz pianist Cecil Taylor that with his hands he is more imitating the leaps of dancers than you know just formulas. So I think this kind of what was kind of a crisis of myself, I, I said, okay, uh, I have just neglected this gestural aspect. And the, the book in the middle is my French book, La Vérité du Beau dans la Musique. It's the fir first book where I have dis described this gestural approach. Then after you got the flow gesture in free jazz and musical performance books, which are, of course, integrating gestural research. And the, the last one is now Musical Creativity will come out uh, by Springer in January. So this is kind of my general position. Now more as abstractly or more philosophically speaking, I always talk about the onion ontology, which is kind of an onion of the ontology, and you will see in a minute why. The classical ontology, which I always used, has three dimensions in music, namely communication, you know, from the poiesis to the aesthesis, uh, the, of course, semiotic uh, aspect of science and the realities of physics and psychology and, and, and symbolic things. And I think um, to, to approach the gestural uh, extension, I added to this cube a fourth dimension, which is what I call the embodiment dimension. And it means that in music you are not happy with facts, but you ultimately want to make gestures. And I think there are three levels now which connect these things, namely the, the innermost factual level of the, of the facts, you know, um, like Wittgenstein, Die Welt ist alles, was der Fall ist. 
the, the world is everything, which is the case, which is a fact. But this is, I think, not everything. <laughs> you also need the machines which produce these facts, and this is kind of uh, represented by what I call processes, yes? Uh, like in the American transformational theory, where you have this block design, this kind of uh, flow charts with units and then arrows which connect the units. And But of course this is not the most real thing. This is kind of a, a machine which produces something but is, is still an abstract thing. Now if you go into an industrial plant where they produce cars, you see what is in the center. It's not the flow charts but it's the gestures, namely these robots. Yes, it's, it's gestures. So I think gestures are really the, the thing where the, the uh, the real thing happened. So uh, I developed kind of a, a whole uh, concept framework which connects the facts to the gestures, right? So I'm going to talk about that now. Um, in the following sense that we have one, we have three levels now, right? We have the level of facts where, where you have the nodes, the courts, and so on, which can be represented in more or less gener general uh, concept frameworks. My own one is the, uh, that one of, of denotators, which kind of is a, gen a generic language uh, for uh, musical concepts. And the second one would then be the level of processes where you have diagrams, right? You have points and they are connected by arrows. And this is typical for also the American transformational theory. And this is, of course, more than the facts. It just kind of connects these facts as, as they are produced. And then the, the, three, the third level would be the level of gestures where you really have mo continuous movement in some topological spaces. And in this systematic thing you have several movements, several transformations. The first one would be something which I call poietize, you know, from the communication theory, poiesis means the making. So this transforms the, the facts into an interpretation as results of transformations. And I think this is the, the center of, the, uh, of David Lewin's I idea of a transformational theory, that you are not happy with the results, but you also want to tell how these results come up. And so that means that you take an object and you, you look at the path, which is defined by certain transformations, and you get that the result, and the result would then be, again, some fact. So this is kind of the connection of these two things here. And I w that's what I would call factualized. You, you just go through the process and then you have a result. The second thing uh, would be to transform gestures into, uh, into uh, to, to processes. And this is what we will describe uh, below by a, a finger input. So we, we are interested to make gestures in order to describe processes. I think this is extremely important because this is a human approach, right? Um, and this is what I would call formalize. Then the opposite would be that you take uh, certain process diagram diagrams and transformation, transform them into gestures, and I'll describe that by use of the Brüha uh, decomposition of transformations in mathematics. That will be just very short, but just that you see how it works. Okay, so that's what I would call gestualized. And I think this whole con conceptual framework is very important to connect abstract categories of music to the most concrete gestural ones. And I think that, that you need the theory of that, otherwise kind of music uh, splits into uh, disconnected things. And I think this is extremely important. When you make instruments, you work, of course, on the lowest level of gestures, but you also are interested in kind of connecting these concrete uh, gestural uh, utterances to more abstract categories, right? So I think this is kind of a an idea. And I uh, will then uh, also describe the Rubato software approach where we are working in this direction. Okay, let's start with the upper thing here. Now let's go a little bit into some concept fr frameworks. And uh, I have to apologize that I'm always making this abstract stuff here, but I think uh, that the abstract is the concrete. Yes, I, I believe that the humans when they walk through, this, uh, through a street, yes, they are so strongly abstracting from what's really going on. You know, you don't care about your, your physiological details, you just go from here to there. So I, I, our survival is really <laughs> by abstraction. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Uh, so I think the abstract is the concrete here. 
Yes, so um, to, to say something about uh, the general concept framework which I, I'm using in this whole theory is, uh, of course, coming from a mathematical a topos theory, which is kind of one, one of the uh, cutting-edge theories nowadays, uh, there are three compound space types. And I think perhaps this can also help these archiving problems of a generic language where you can describe things and also always uh, extend the concepts uh, as opposite to a... a, a, a um, kind of uh, the, the, the classical uh, concept uh, frameworks which you have. So let's see, perhaps that can help a little bit. There are three com compound space types. One is the product, which means you have a space and, it, and its points are described just by giving coordinates for each of those, of those uh, coordinate spaces. Yes, You describe something by the conjunction of properties. It has this and this and this and this. The second uh, typical uh, space is the, the union, which is either this or this. So you, it's like the library, yes, you have to choose some space to say where it is. So it's the, the uh, um, conjunction, not the, disjun uh, the, the disjunction, not the conjunction. And then the third one is just a collection. When you have a set, you know, just put things into a big bag. And so these are the three typical spaces we, which you need in the top mathematics of our days, and this is used also in my concept framework. Right? So when, I, when you hear Colimit, just think about the library. Yes. So um, our, our spaces are called forms. A form has a name, and it has a type, and it has a coordinate. The name is just, um, don't look too, too clearly here, it's just kind of a, a, a Unicode uh, a, a word string, right? And it has a type, this means it's either a, a simple mathematical object, like a module, or it is um, a limit, or a colimit, or a or power. So it's kind of one of those uh, three compound forms, or it's a simple form. And then it has also a functor, which means it's, it's kind of a, a geometric space which is as, as associated with these uh, coordinated types. And, of course, as in mathematics always, you need also morphisms, kind of functions between such objects. And what you have is if you have two such forms, f and g, you look at their functors and you have a, tr a natural transformation of functors, which is uh, the thing which plays the role of, of functions in this big category. So there's kind of a, a nice mathematical context where you have all these things. So this is the category of forms. It's kind of a, a big, big category of spaces, space types, where all types of spaces which can be conceived in modern thinking are comprised. Now, um, our, our uh, usage of this is arrow form. We need arrows because we, we want to work on processes. So an arrow has a name, arrow form, space has a name, arrow, of course, and it contains uh, two names, NF and NF, two name objects and an arrow index, which means that the arrow index is just the index of, of a certain abstract arrows, and we have two names which give you know where the arrow starts, where it ends. So everything is kind of formally described by such a space here, and then, Using these arrows and, uh, and, and names, you can then define paths here, a path of length n, which means you have a first arrow and then the projection to its domain or codomain and then a second arrow and its projections to its domain. So you connect arrows by uh, common namespaces. And that gives then kind of a formal description of uh, such such uh, paths in, in diagrams, right? And then you can co col collect all these things and you get the path category, which means the category of all these paths of different lengths. So we have a formal description of such arrows, right? And then, um, now this is interesting. When you have this, you can now construct dynamic nodes and scores, which means the following. A dynamic node is just a node plus a path. So a node is just something which you know. It's kind of something which has an onset, a pitch, a loudness, a duration, a voice, typically. And the path then would be a path which uses this node to, to develop new nodes. So the dynamic score would then be a set of such 
a dynamic node, so an, uh, it would look like this. A, a typical dynamic score would be something which in this case has three such dynamic nodes, one, two, and three, and it looks like you take the initial denotators and then you take paths. You take paths in the form diagram, so you describe kind of starting objects and then paths of transformations. So what you have here is kind of a historical thing. You not only have the results, but you also have the whole path how these things were constructed, yes? So here a node is not just a result, but it's kind of the whole history how you have produced that. And that's something we are implementing now, that you not only have the resulting composition, but the whole history history, how you produced it, uh, represented by such paths. Okay, so a typical example is what we call satellites. The classical situation is the following. In a parameter space you have a node, and for example you have a trail. What is a trail? You have just, you know, a bunch of satellites which are these kind of alternative pitches which relate to the starting uh, node as an anchor. So this is the typical classical thing. Now, to make that dynamic, we, we uh, make something new. Instead of taking the classical node with its uh, satellite, we take now uh, the node with its history, how it is, ha has been constructed by transformations, and then we take also the same for the satellites, and now we can look at the whole uh, future which works as follows, the satellite is just shifted by a certain amount to the anchor node, then the anchor node can just develop in, in a future uh, process, and we can take then uh, the, the inverse transformation delta to the minus delta and produce a new satellite. So we, you see we can just develop this whole thing uh, for satellites just by taking their history and then connecting the history. So this whole model works also for, for kind of uh, hierarchical structures in musical notation. Okay, um, now I, I want to switch to the relation between transformational diagrams and gestures. So the, the second and the third layer. And um, here I have to say what is a gesture. Oh well, that sounds horrible here. A gesture with a skeleton is a, a, di a directed graph gamma, and the body, which is a topological category X, in a, is a continuous functor from the path category uh, of gamma to X, where this, the path category is the topological category of continuous paths on uh, the, the digraph gamma. Now that sounds horrible. I can imagine that nobody understands a single word. But uh, it's, it's something very simple, but it, it, intuitively you just have a directed graph, right? Some uh, vertices and some arrows, and you represent this graph as a, a, the combination of continuous curves in a topological space. So it's what you really imagine, like moving Moving around, right? And this space can have time and, and pitch and other things as coordinates, so it's kind of a moving hand, right? So uh, it's kind of a, a, a configuration of curves which are connected in the sense of this skeletal directed graph. I think this is the, the general situation. What I'm writing here is just a modern mathematical sh shape of this st statement, right? But I think this is a um, a, a good precise definition of what is a gesture. I have never seen a precise definition of a gesture. Everybody knows what is a gesture, like what is time, 